Okay. So the meeting tonight, we'll run through uh, what we've got going on. We're going to uh, run through the acceptance of the me the minutes from last meeting. <laughs> New business. The big topic for the exciting topic for tonight is the Transportation and Climate Action Group presentation. You know, that was what everybody's been waiting for this month. And then old business is going to be Climate Action Plan Update, Green Building Subcommittee. We were going to have a presentation on the plastic problem, but Jess had to be out of town, so we're moving that to December. Is there anything I'm missing? Oh, and we do have, if there's any other business, I know there was mention of other business. I don't know if you want to give us a little teaser first or if we'll just wait till the end and then we'll we can uh, ask you yeah very briefly there's a, a bill in congress that has a chance of passing uh, that would provide direct uh support to coastal communities okay um, who are at the effect of sea level rise and storm surge okay. and uh senator shaheen is actively supporting it now co-sponsoring it um senator hassan has not yet and uh representative pathos has not yet so let's bring that, we'll bring that up at the end as other right. business, and <clears throat> I'm sure some folks will probably have some questions. Thank you. Yes. Uh, John couldn't come tonight. He's got some health issues. And um, I just wanted to follow up on the Clean Energy New Hampshire proposal. I think you were going to talk to the city manager and just hear what's up with that. Okay. So Great. We've got that. Okay. All right. So let's get started with the minutes, the acceptance of the minutes from last month. I'm assuming everybody read those. And do we have a, a vote for accepting those meeting minutes? Move to approve the minutes. Okay. Well, I should have asked first if there were any concerns or changes, but okay. Anyone want a second? Second. Right. We'll a second from Effie. So we will, the meeting minutes from October 27th have been accepted. Okay, moving into new business, and that is Transportation Climate Action Group, the TCAG. And we're going to get a presentation tonight. And Bill, I'm going to hand the floor over and the meeting to you. Okay, well, thank you. And thanks to the committee for including us on the agenda and apologize for creating a new acronym, TCAG. <laughs> <laughs> Couldn't help it. Uh, um, we are, I guess, formally a subgroup of the Climate Solutions Group. And uh, we formed in July and have been meeting since... Um, since August weekly, and this is actually the first time we've actually met each other other than weekly meetings on Zoom. So this is a great uh, privilege to actually see these people that they're not this big. Uh, um, our, uh, let's see, Peter. If I'm I just trying to make it big, yeah. I'm yeah. trying to share a screen in case we get anybody. You can't pull around the PowerPoint file at all? This one? Yeah, can you just do that? Yeah, great. Uh, yeah, but that's not, so you're thinking that online they'll see the, mm -hmm. yeah, they will. they're going to see it big. It says you're still screen sharing, so you should be fine. Okay. All right. So we'll, we'll hopefully this will work. And then this, okay. Can I do that? Just hide the top bar too. That thing? Okay. There you go. Great. There you go. Thank you. Huh. Yep. So, um. Our uh, vision is to uh, develop climate-friendly transportation solutions as input to the Portsmouth CAP. And um, in so doing, serve as uh, advisors, providers of food for thought to this committee, to climate solutions, and to um, city staff. And um, it's a very big topic. Um, this committee and climate solutions have particularly climate solutions, have heard different versions of this presentation. And every time we hear to make it smaller, make it smaller, like the Zoom, the Zoom frame. So this is our attempt to, uh, having negotiated with Peter on time, to try to keep this to 20 minutes, although I think we've got a little wiggle room for some comments after each of our five topics. And in the uh, check-in, I think you, you, you met the committee members or our group members. Uh, each of us has taken one of five what we consider to be core topics. So for me, it's shared mobility, which includes public transit, 
Uh, Matt and uh, Jonathan are talking about uh, walking and biking. Fred, e-vehicles. Ken, who is not here, he had a last minute medical emergency, so we don't get his uh, architect's wisdom on land use and transportation, but we have the wonderful slide deck that he helped put together and his slides, and I'll, I'll try to say a few things about that. It's really a very important topic. Uh, Ani is talking about uh, community engagement, and then we've had the benefit of, of Ben uh, when he can join us yeah, on uh, <laughs> representing uh, the Echo Club and uh, Portsmouth High. But uh, if we continue the activities of this group, we hope to get a lot more involvement from the high school. But uh, next slide. Thank you. And we have a, a set of core principles, which I think I've presented to this committee earlier, as we've gotten input from you on our, our vision and um, principles and early, early strategies. And the strategies is the most important uh, part of what we have, have to say. And in squeezing this slide, I managed to drop the first core principle, which is sustainability. And it's much easier to talk about every transportation strategy through the window of reduced greenhouse gas emissions. I mean, that's hard enough. But when you look at that and say, we also want to talk about the classic three E's of sustainability, environment, uh, eco economy, and especially uh, social equity. And I think you'll hear a little bit of the flavor of that in our, our once over lightly uh, tonight. Uh, view, but sustainability, and since this is the su sustainability committee, it's quite appropriate that, that we're applying that as our first core principle. Uh, shifting to transportation, uh, we're looking for where the uh, opportunities are to take transportation from arguably the biggest sectoral source of greenhouse gas emissions in Portsmouth as it is nationally and globally to um, start offering some possible solutions that could find their way into the cap. And the two categories of um, strategies that we've focused on, and these are really classic. You'll find these in uh, probably every one of the inventory of uh, best practice caps that, that uh, this group has reviewed, is a, a mode shift from um, climate unfriendly modes, personal uh, motorized vehicles, to uh, carbon-friendly, carbon-neutral modes uh, to reduce vehicle miles traveled, and that means uh, more public transit, shared mobility, walking and biking, demand management, uh, shopping from home, um, compact development to reduce the length of trips, all those sorts of things just to get people out of uh, climate-unfriendly modes into uh, carbon-friendly modes and to uh, transition to alternative fuel vehicles. EVs. Uh, we take a systems approach. Uh, we don't like looking at individual modes fragmented. We don't like planning modes fragmented. We don't like investing in modes fragmented. I think there's a lot of that going on in Portsmouth like there is in most communities. Uh, the the um, ap approach as a principle is to look at, at how all these modes connect together, and we've tried to do that with our five, five topics and strategies. And then again, something that we've heard from this committee and from Peter going into the CAP, the really significant importance of public engagement, community engagement, and building political will for implementation. Because if that wasn't necessary, all these wonderful things would already be done. We've had, we've had, we'd have greenhouse gas friendly transportation, wonderful bike lanes, we'd have state of the art public transit. Um, but all these things take changes in first in travel behavior and second um, uh, often investments, uh, public or private investments. Uh, next, next slide. Um, so our first topic is, there you go, thanks Peter, is, is shared mobility. And shared mobility may be an unfamiliar concept. Uh, riding a bus is shared mobility, but also car sharing, uh, bike sharing, e-scooter sharing, um, and then using apps to access all those, ideally all together. So if you want to go from point A to point B, and I think you'll see that in a lot of available apps, but the state of the practice is to really have that as um, a way of connecting to get around the city of Portsmouth, to get from Portsmouth to uh, CNJ to get to Boston, to get to Logan, to get to Portland, uh, to uh, find a bike share 
to um, to get on the coast or get on Wildcat. I mean, the, that that is really what we mean by shared mobility, and it includes, but it's not limited to uh, buses. Next slide. And in running through our five topics, we follow a pattern of first short introduction of the topic and its uh, potential relevance to the CAP. Then uh, a few words about the Portsmouth context that may make this hopefully a bit easier to undertake because things are already in, in place. And then third, a strategy. And that's how we squeeze the time. We went from lots of strategies to one strategy per topic to try to give you something interesting to think about and maybe discuss. But the secret is we've got lots more strategies. We're only going to talk about one per topic, but hopefully they'll be be interesting ones, and then um, a best a best practice. And in the case of uh, shared mobility, a uh, wonderful best practice that I got to um, enjoy when uh, my wife and I visited uh, Savannah this spring. We arrived without a car. We didn't even think about driving there or renting a car. It's like Portsmouth, only bigger, historic, lots of traffic, virtually no parking. But what they have that we don't have is this wonderful free circulating bus that goes through the historic district. It um, serves residents, uh, workers, and tourists. And it's managed by the city of Savannah, by the Savannah Public Transit Agency, and then an association of private businesses, particularly hotels. Uh, and they fund it with a, I guess you call it a pillow tax, a dollar a night that generates a million dollars this is a nonprofit, so they can take uh, tax-deductible contributions from NGOs or businesses or individuals, and there's no need for a car there if you're visiting. Uh, we rented a car when we left town. Uh, but our one strategy for this is to try something like that in Portsmouth that would complement existing bus service, whether it's from Coast, the public agency, or uh, from, from uh, Wildcat, we have Uber and Lyft complement that as well, but something that could be a proof of concept that would provide service that really is not present, that gets you from primary origin to primary destination directly without the need to transfer, uh, easy to use, app-based, hopefully able to take advantage of all the new federal funds, and I say this as a 40-year U.S. Department of Transportation uh, civil servant who just retired. There are piles of wonderful programs for climate and public transit and walking and biking and great opportunities for the city to tap into that. And um, so that's the one idea we have for this. And with our pattern, we could take a couple of quick comments on this, but we want to get through our topics pretty quickly so we have time to talk about next steps. But any any thoughts on the viability of this besides things we can't do, like no pillow tax. It looks, <laughs> it looks like there's something to hold bikes on the front of the of bus. Course, yes, definitely. Yeah. I have yeah. been on the bus, and it is great. It's have amazing. you been on the bus? Yeah. It's, it's wonderful. <laughs> every, t every 10 minutes, it just loops. Wow. Loops, and it's free. We have an example of this in Portsmouth, uh, the trolley that we run over the holiday season. Yeah, so this would be a variation on that theme. In fact, it could be expanding that, ideally. And again, as a proof of concept, it could be uh, evaluated. I think the critical part of it is not the technology or the operations, but it's the funding. And there was some discussion of micro-mobility, which fits into some of the flexible schedule and um, routing that's possible with uh, shared mobility um, in the first round of discussions over the McIntyre. And I think that got stuck on a shuttle back and forth to uh, parking garages from McIntyre, which to me didn't seem like it would be very useful, but could be a key first part of something that might link uh, CNJ and P's and affordable housing coming on uh, Route 1 South. Uh, um, yeah, so partnership. I lived in uh, Park City, Utah, and there they they have in their downtown area, they have a shuttle that if anybody's mm -hmm. been there, that runs around. It actually looks like a trolley, but uh, I've used it a number of times to get yeah. from you know one end of the downtown to the other end. It just comes around and it's free. Um, 
We, we so. probably have 10 examples from Savannah to Charleston to Salem and Burlington, Montpelier. Uh, no if you've been up to Acadia and you've ridden on mm -hmm. the L.L. Bean bus that serves tourists, bike riders, and uh, workers. Yeah. So that's our one that's our one concept. So we'll roll on to the next concept, which is Matt and Jonathan talking about uh, bike ped. There's only time sure. for one of us. Yeah, oh yeah, so um, Jonathan and I focused on this, but with a lot of input from everybody, it's a topic everybody uh, had a lot uh, of ideas on. Um, so um, I have a, a lot of good news to share on this. Um, Portsmouth has been named the most walkable city in the state. Um, that's in large part due to our compact development, especially in the downtown core, um, and also investments in sidewalks and other improvements that have been made over the years. Um, our walking and biking commute rates are well above the national average, uh, with around 5.7% of commutes on foot and 2.4% by bike, motorcycle, or taxi, and that was according to the 2014 bike ped plan. Um, across the U.S., uh, we know that about half of all car trips are for under three miles, probably similar here, uh, so there's a great opportunity to shift some of those trips. Uh, out of single occupancy vehicles to other modes to reduce greenhouse gases. Uh, that, of course, includes e-scooters and e-bikes, as we talked about already this morning or this evening. Um, and uh, I'll mention e-bikes are now outselling electric cars two to one. Mm -hmm. So there's been a huge uh, boom there. Um, there's also a lot of enthusiasm for bike and walk improvements. Um, as you see in the <coughs> photo there, the mayor's ride, that was half the crowd, and um, lots of great energy around um, biking for recreation, but also very much for transportation. Um, there are so many co-benefits uh, around community health, safety, um, reduced congestion and parking demand, uh, equity we could talk about for a while, and also economic benefits to uh, better walking and biking. Um, a lot of the good work around policies and plans has already been done here in Portsmouth. Uh, they just need follow through. So we do have a bike friendly and walk friendly community policy, uh, complete streets policy. Uh, we've had a safe routes to school program for years. Um, and we have a very comprehensive uh, bike and pedestrian plan uh, in 2014, updated last in 2018. Um, if we could see the next slide, uh, we did look at peer examples, and I'll just show one from Charleston, uh, not moving too far from Savannah in the field. Um, I liked that it ranks strategies by emissions reductions, cost, and priority, which is um, not something you see quite in that sense from the bike ped plan because it's not focused on greenhouse gases in the same way. Um, but uh, besides hard infrastructure like bike lanes, they call for wayfinding, uh, safety education, safe bike storage, and so on. Uh, these are all important, but uh, research suggests that more than anything else, uh, concerns about the safety of cycling and especially the fear of getting hit by cars are what are keeping people off of bikes. Uh, so we have a number of recommended strategies, uh, many of which are already in reports like that bike ped plan or the um, Portsmouth master plan and just need follow through. Uh, our top recommendation is for an update to the bike ped plan uh, that prioritizes completing gaps in the places that are most likely to allow a mode shift. Uh, so I think that means focusing on routes linking housing, employment, shopping, and especially public transit, uh, such as the Route 1, uh, Woodbury, and Maplewood corridors. Um, this plan update should identify clearly what can be done at low cost in the near term, uh, let's say two years, and also what should be prioritized in the six-year time frame of the CIP. Uh, then beyond planning, the actual progress toward that network should be reported at least annually to the City Council. So um, that's what I have. If there are um, thoughts, comments, questions, we could take a couple. I, I love that you talk about the safety thing because I think that that's Share. I, I've had that experience. You know, you go and you bike for a while, and then you have one like close call, and you're like, "Yeah, I don't know if I want to do that every morning on my way to work." And it only takes one. And I think that it's good to hear that that's mm -hmm. high on the list because I think that's important. Mm -hmm. I just I wanted to say that one of the things that was the most disappointing thing to me um, after joining the city council was when we were going through the CIP budget 
and realizing that there wasn't funding for bike ped there wasn't additional funding in the cip budget um, for this year um, and that you know that budget process starts in the fall so it's already begun for next year but that coming into the council kind of in the middle of the cip and looking at it and saying Ugh, we don't have any funds and that means like for the next year and a half we're not putting additional investment there um, was really disappointing and so hopefully we can push for more funds so that by july we have funds sitting there maybe that will be easier with uh, that kind of um, information in uh, a cap for bike ped or shared mobility or any of the other topics because then that gives you a reference particularly if there's a public and a uh, political commitment to the cap it's much easier than to say you know for Matt to appear before the capital budget committee and say this is a really important link it's a really important link because one reason it's in the cap what about funding from sources outside of the city like the Department of Transportation mm -hmm. there must be grants and other programs for walkability bikeability um, Right. right. So ab ab it, yeah. Absolutely. And having worked for seven years on a $100 million walk and bike federal program, there are lots of new funds in the both the uh, Infl Inflation Reduction Act slash Climate Act and the Infrastructure mm -hmm. Bill. Okay. And a lot of those are um, managed through the Rockingham Planning Commission or New Hampshire DOT, but they're intended for local governments. So there is a, there is a process to be played, but there is money that's available. Yeah, and I think in our in our full report on this topic, we included a link that you had found that lists all the yeah. different categories of funding available. So that that's in there. Also, there's flexible funds that come to the state DOT and to the Rockingham Planning Commission. That's um, it may be called highway funds, but it's intended to be flexible funds. And cities can make a case through the planning process that Portsmouth participates in to prioritize that through the, through the planning process. I would say um, one of the deterrents that the school board hears a lot is if you look in our direct downtown area, there's very few places to place bikes. And and we're in theft, I just had to attend the Ward 3 and Ward 5 forums, and bike theft is really on the rise. And, and even at our schools, we don't have enough racks for the kids that want to rise. Like, I think to, one quick change is taking a look at where we offer bike racks in places that are accessible so so that it encourages the use of bikes more. I think Jonathan has thoughts on something. that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well at the high school there's there's not enough. No. Nor any of the elementary schools. Yeah. And I've been in discussions with Councillor Cook about that. It's frustrating that um, fortunately Saber has uh, donated a, a bike rack which is supposed to was ordered and should be arriving Take a little bit of time but yeah yeah right. so we're donating a, a bike rack to the high school and and maybe we should talk also to the elementary school I mean no one has approached us but yeah but I, I think safe storage is a big theme especially with expensive e-bikes now people yep. love to ride them but they don't feel safe leaving them for 20 minutes so right. um, indoor storage if possible uh, I, we don't think that they necessarily need charging in um, on location most people will charge them at home but uh, indoor or safe, you know, storage. Which certainly seems like money well spent if it's city, city funds for that, if that's what's preventing people. Hmm. I know a lot of times, oh. too, that can be a business incentive. I, I, are you a steamboat? There's, I remember being in a place in Colorado, and it was like if businesses had a bike rack, they, can, uh, they didn't have to pay for their signage fees. <laughs> so, like, there was just, like, they did trade-offs like that, where it was something that a lot of businesses are doing anyways. And it's a, for them, it's a bike rack, and it's people coming oftentimes to their coffee shop or their... So I think there's some creativity. The, the ta federal tax code allows um, businesses to provide a transit benefits for... Um, employees and take a tax deduction for that and that's been expanded over the years to cover um, biking as well whether it's showers or bike helmets uh, hmm. all to try to counterbalance the incentives of free parking and that's been in place for a long time and I commuted to Boston for decades <laughs> benefiting from uh, CNJ tickets being paid 
by the federal government, and that's available to all all businesses. Uh, and I've not heard of that being applied much in Portsmouth. I know the uh, Hanover Street Garage is undergoing renovations now. Is there any opportunities to add covered semi indoor bike storage in there? Um, I know. Years ago, I got to travel to Amsterdam for work, and right next to the train station is a parking garage dedicated to bicycles that has like 10,000 bikes in it. <laughs> yeah, finding your bike is a little intimidating. <laughs> <laughs> sure. <laughs> Isn't there a bike storage in the Hanover yeah. garage? I mean, I think there used to be. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know, I don't know if there's plans to, for it to be in there or not. I don't so, know. I haven't heard of any, but so I think that our our risk in this presentation is that we get wonderful discussions and don't roll through. So maybe maybe we can keep the option of continuing this at another meeting. But oh, I think really what what we would love to do is get through all of these and have enough time to get some um, discussion with you about next steps, if any, for this group to continue to be useful. But maybe take a, a note of things that are are interesting you know I think everybody is interested in transportation that's that's really clear so if you, if you don't mind we'll roll on to the next topic which is uh, Fred talking about uh, EVs so uh, based on the check-in question everybody seems to be familiar with EVs and uh, you probably know that e you know, EVs have, have a potential to uh, greatly reduce carbon uh, emissions um, <laughs> it, it takes e it takes carbon to build an EV uh, but once you put it on the road, uh, you start you start getting benefits from from uh, having a zero emission vehicle. And it's also dependent on the electric grid. The cleaner your electrical grid is, the the, the, the better, the more beneficial the EVs are. So as your as your grid improves, the car you bought you know last year is going to be more efficient because your grid is more efficient. Um, and so with, you know things like community community power, uh, as as that comes online, that'll that'll help us be able to charge up EVs more more efficiently. And, uh, and the auto industry is, you know, is, is, is shifting gears to, to uh, projecting that, you know, in another decade or two, all of its vehicles will be electric. Um, so so there, there's a big trend there. Uh, in fact, Ford is building a big uh, factory in Tennessee just for building pickup trucks, electric pickup trucks. Hopefully they're cheaper than Rivian. But. Yeah. <laughs> um, Ranger, just make an electric Ranger. Yeah, right, right. And a Amazon uh, is putting 100,000 uh, electric uh, vans on the road so that when they're bringing you packages, they're not, you know, spewing carbon into your neighborhood. Uh, so, you know, so the trend is, um, is there. So the question is, uh, how, how can we take advantage of it here? Uh, obviously, Portsmouth can think about, you know, electrifying its fleet of vehicles. But the big benefit for Portsmouth is to get the residents, help the residents uh, you know, buy uh, and use uh, electric vehicles. So the, uh, the main thing that, that we can do to enable that is by you know, improving the charging infrastructure. Um, you know, so uh, there's a lot of ways we can we can do that. One of them is to um, the, infl the Inflation Reduction Act uh, has provisions for 500,000 uh, charging stations nationwide, and those funds are available for us to tap into to uh, to be able to start building some more charging stations, um, and also do, to, to do some more planning in terms of you know some like the Foundry Garage has I think tr three chargers per floor. Um, as time goes by, we'll probably need more of them and make sure that all all the parking areas, surface parking, curbside parking. Has, uh, has charging available. Um, and uh, the other thing is that uh, looking at building codes, making sure that as we build new buildings, whether it's residential or commercial, that there's uh, some kind of guidelines in terms of making allowances for, for charging, and particularly multifam uh, multifamily housing, you know, apartment buildings and things like that, which I think are underserved. You know, somebody with a, a garage and a driveway can just plug into a, an outlet, but if you live in, a, in an apartment building or something like that, it may not be so easy to, to get access to a charging facility. And the best best place to charge your car is at home because it's it's cheaper and it's um, it's it's easier on the batteries. So um, and, and also in looking at multifamily housing, we have to make sure we include uh, you know all income levels. So if, if it's uh, you know worker housing or low income housing, uh, they should have equal access to those kind of facilities. And also we can even think about um, EV charging uh, um, as, as a source of tourism. You know, so if if people knew that they could stop in Portsmouth. And, and plug, you know, go into a, a lot that has charging and go have a nice dinner before they, they drive out to Bar Harbor or something like that. You know, that, that can be a way of bringing in tourists and also uh, uh, getting economic advantage of, of, of being kind of a leader in that sort of thing. So in terms of the, the climate action plan, we think that for EVs, 
as one of the elements of the climate action plan, uh, you know, a charging infrastructure is a key thing to include in that plan and to invest in. So next, next slide. So as, as Bill said, we looked at a lot of climate action plans for other uh, areas. Uh, this one is from uh, Marin County, California. Uh, Marin, Marin is uh, bigger than Portsmouth. It has about 10 times the population. So it's not, a, not an even match, but it's, it's very uh, interesting in terms of the aggressiveness with which they're pursuing climate change across all, all areas. Uh, so they, they in, their, in their climate inventory, they determined that one third of their carbon output comes from the transportation industry. So they're, they're targeting, it, targeting it heavily in this plan. Um, and their goal is also very aggressive. They want to reduce their total carbon emissions across all, all areas uh, to 40% to of what it was in 1990. So uh, that's, that's a pretty aggressive goal. And uh, for transportation, they're pursuing all the types of things we're talking about here, you know, more bicycling and walking and, and busing and things like that. Um, but EVs are, have, have a, a key part of that, you know, given the, given the size of Marin County. And they want to put 45% uh, of the cars on the road, uh, have them converted to EVs by 2030. And they, um, their estimate is by doing that, they'll achieve 86% of their, of that, uh, of that climate, of that carbon reduction goal, uh, through the EVs, and then the other elements of the plan make up the other 14%. So, um, I mean, all, all of those things are very beneficial. Uh, but just, the point is that uh, you know, investing in the EVs um, has a very big impact because a lot of people, you know, use cars. So, um, uh, that's that's kind of the message. Any questions about that? I have a comment on that. Yes. For those who do not know, uh, this past city count, this current city council, has included seven hundred fifty thousand dollars in this, in our cap improvement plan. So one hundred fifty thousand dollars every year starting this upcoming fiscal year for electric vehicle charging stations, both level two and level three, uh, dispersed throughout on public land, and it's on back order. I'm guessing due to supply chain issues. But there's a level two charger that's going to be installed at the Bridge Street lot once it comes in. Good. And kind of speaking on the Bridge Street, some of the stuff in the green building and infrastructure committee we're working on is taking a page out of making sure that as parking lots get repaved on the municipality side, that even if the charging station maybe isn't put in, that the infrastructure to be able to put it more easily in is while it's being mm -hmm, mm -hmm. torn up and replaced. And the same with some of the public buildings. But there is a whole, I think the multifamily thing is a really good thing to look into because that's huge. What, what type of and how much funding is available for char for the city to implement uh, charging stations through the Inflation Reduction Act? And, and are, I guess I, I guess the question for the on the city side is, are we pursuing getting funds for charging stations through that mechanism? I, I don't have a detailed answer for your question, but I know that there's a lot of different components of that of that bill, and um, and the bill's provided some details about that that we can look at and kind of see exactly where that funding would come from and how much is available. We we should note that this is the Cliff's Notes version of the presentation, and we'll provide this and the longer version. Plus, we have two to three page uh, topic summaries for each of these, many of which have some of these links, like to the the federal funding sources. So I want to piggyback on something you said earlier, Bill, is the question is, there was some great, what you're presenting so far, and I don't want to derail us, there's, there's some great actions that we as the city and the citizens could start taking, and it would be fantastic, you know, at some point here in the future to pick some of these out. Like, it'd be great to do more research on the charging stations and how, do, how would the city go about acquiring funds or obtaining funds through the Inflation Reduction Act? Um, and what could that, I mean, what could we purchase with, with that, right? What could we do? Um, and those, you know, these things take a long time, right? There's a lot, I understand there's a lot of paperwork and processes to go through, but to start pushing some of these things. Well, forward. I think these are intended to have an impact on the climate and fast track and perhaps before the Congress I guess it's already changing, but um, uh, the, the, the funds are there, the funds are committed, and I th think uh, Secretary Pete and uh, the rest of the 50,000 uh, agency is, I think, very eager to roll those funds out, but each of those has a different process, and probably uh, Peter and Kate's, not yourselves, your colleagues and staff, 
do this sort of thing. Mm -hmm. we'll, we'll, we'll look into that and try to get a more detailed answer. Yeah, thank you. Fantastic information. Yeah. Just uh, before we, yeah, sorry. I was just going to have one other comment. I was at a conference yesterday in Massachusetts, the uh, Passive House Massachusetts um, one-day symposium, and another potential overlap for uh, the building subcommittee is one of the things they're putting into their updated stretch code is that um, new construction will be EV ready. So they at least have to put in the electrical infrastructure for future charging, even if they don't have chargers built in right then. Um, which, I don't know, it, we're a different state with very different rules, but um, that'd be something to try to promote in our mm -hmm. own building codes. So what do you mean is like that? So what does that mean, Aubrey? Like they have to have a 220 outlet out to the street or something um, like I that? I think or? it's a 50 amp circuit has to be built in that's dedicated for that. Um, not necessarily out to the street, but at least the capacity of the overall um, electrical uh, panel has to be so capable of it, ready. and there has yep. to be a, a dedicated circuit ready to go if somebody's ready to put it in. So they don't have to, you know, bring in new lines from the street, yep. a whole new panel, yep. everything at that point. Cool. For a uh, transition to the next topic, which will be a quick topic, because uh, Ken, uh, who is the land use uh, guru, had a last minute uh, medical problem, so wasn't able to join us. So I'll be doing a real short version of that, but I think just looking at that slide, I think you can see um, consistency with our principles that we're looking at uh, connectivity between all of our topics and strategies, and you can see those laid out right there in Marin County's cap, which at least from the transportation perspective is probably one of the best ones I think that I've seen uh, really in the country, but you can see all the elements there. Um, the um, maybe uh, next next slide, Peter, for the for the um, for the land use and all, all these elements fit into the broader and complex but critical topic of aligning transportation and land use decisions. And I, I just found out that Ken wasn't able to join us today at about uh, 15 minutes before the the meeting. So I'm not going to spend much time on this. Maybe there'll be a chance for him to talk about it in more detail. But the truth is, if we're trying to scale transportation greenhouse gas reductions, if the development in place and the new development in the future is not planned and invested with the thought of transportation going both directions, aligning <coughs> transportation with development and development with land, the it'll be inevitable that the bike paths will be empty and the buses will be empty and the ability to have scale sorts of um, impacts will be lost. Um, this is done through a, a lot of different mechanisms, things that uh, Portsmouth uh, City staff and, and organizations are very involved with things from land use policy to zoning to incentives for developers. Uh, we were just talking about uh, charging requirements for land use. Um, when we get a chance to have Ken talk a bit more, he can talk about parking in lieu of requirements that might, uh, in other communities, best practice communities, require developers uh, who are not, who, are, who waive parking requirements for new development to um, commit to trip reduction through transit benefits or through um, um, uh, Uber and bus pickup and drop off facilities, just all sorts of things to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions and the travel, vehicle miles traveled over their employees as part of, of the development process and the zoning. That can also include um, charging infrastructure. We know that the brick uh, yard um, development, brick market, uh, brick market uh, is going to have 30 charging, I believe, 30 charging stations for its residents. A, a very nice amenity and something that gives them a, an opportunity to um, herald, herald their envi environmental um, commitment. Same thing with um, uh, other, other sorts of, of organizations. That, that can either be encouraged through education, incentivized, or required. And there are lots of best practices on that. Our, our one uh, great and I think very interesting uh, strategy here is the is complete neighborhoods in a 15-minute city 
and that is looking both at strengthening existing quasi 15 minute cities you know I live about a mile from downtown so I consider myself in a 15 minute city although I can't get groceries and hardware and I guess uh, pretty close though and I know that Ani and um, Jonathan are very very happy in uh, the West End which is a 15 minute com uh, community <laughs> the strategy is to strengthen that where it exists and to look for places where it would make sense to um, add new ones. Uh, you can see this, um, the radius there, a five minute walk, 15, uh, uh, 15 minute bike rides, often the 15 minute city includes transit options as well and Paris is quite famous for that. So that's our one top priority strategy for this topic and we've got lots of other ones that are, are related to it. But like our other topics, you can see that there, it, it brings in all these elements, the mode shift and um, uh, the land use as well. Any thoughts and questions on this? A, yeah. I don't know if it's a question, but how does it fit in? Um, when you said Paris, it reminded me that they have all sorts of shared bike, shared yeah. vehicle. And how did that fit into all this? Is that something that's that, that, on that, the rise or is it gone? That, that fits into both the walking biking topic that Matt and Jonathan yep. worked on and the shared mobility one as well. It could fit into the land use as well. And uh, Paris very uh, consciously combined the, um, all the shared uh, bikes, which I think there's some of that in Portsmouth, but lots and lots of U.S. cities and international cities have that. It's pretty well, pretty well established and in many cases transitioning to uh, electric bikes. And Paris did that in combination with major investments in um, safe bike lanes and protected bikeways in combination. And what's interesting is that that's fairly recent. Just like the Dutch cities haven't had those in, that infrastructure that everyone admires so much for generations. It's, it was conscious policy and conscious investment. Mm -hmm. Some of this is also when we talk about land use and housing, um, we need to get away from our single family zoning that eliminates the opportunity to have multifamily and businesses yeah. within those same zones. You, you can't build some of the most desirable cities we have or neighborhoods we have in Portsmouth. You can't build now yeah. with our existing zoning. And that's a real challenge because people then, if they're, if they're living at a, the further distance you are from the center, the less likely you're going to have a neighborhood shop to go to or a yeah. neighborhood grocery or you're going to have neighbors who live in an apartment complex. You know, if you're in a single family home, you're just, you don't see that when you get outside the center. Uh, ab absolutely. And this sort of thing doesn't make sense with single occupant houses only. Jonathan, I don't know if you wanted to say <coughs> anything about about that and the, the role of density because I think we, we've talked about that a bit even though we probably haven't highlighted it enough. No, no, I agree with, with what you're, you know, we have to do a, with <coughs> single family uh, zoning, a lot of the zoning in the West End, for example, uh, is, is no, there, none of the houses are conforming, um, none of the properties are conforming with, with, the, with the way it's zoned as if it's, as if it were Panaway Manor or something like that and it's, it doesn't make sense um, anyway. And, and then um, right, it's important to have the density. It's important to, to reduce the distances between buildings and reduce the parking requirements and that sort of thing. Make, uh, can, can I just add in something I, I know Ken wanted to include was mention of the Portsmouth 2025 master plan mm -hmm. that includes some of these ideas about complete neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. And I think it doesn't so much recommend forcing a single family neighborhood to change to allow duplexes, um, although that would certainly be fine with me where I live in my single family neighborhood. Um, <laughs> but it targets um, like commercial plazas that are not performing as well on the tax rolls. You know, I see one that like has a Christmas tree sale in December, which tells me that for the busiest shopping month, they're not using all that parking lot. And it suggests, well, you could have housing and office and retail and everything all in this one plaza, better biking and walking, transit, all connected. So especially focusing on, on those opportunities. Yep. And it's in our plans, and some of it just needs follow through. Which is a, per a perfect example of aligning 
the land use development and transportation, and particularly if some of those underused plazas are used for affordable or workforce <coughs> housing, then supported with um, affordable public transit and bike facilities, then you're really getting at the core elements of household affordability, which is housing and transportation. But that's tricky to do, and getting this into a climate action plan, I think, is critical. It's, it's a little different than the specifics we can do about, um, about shared mobility or walking and biking, but it sort of holds everything together. Ben? This quickly reminds me of the dream I have for all of America's derelict malls and plazas to be rezoned and re, you know, rejuvenated and turned into housing or mixed use or some sort of more productive um, use of that space. I, I don't know how far the city can go, where the P's authority, uh, I don't know, you know the legalese of that, but yeah, it's, it's something really I've, I've it's always... It's happening. It's yeah, happening I, around the country. Well, Portsmouth Smart Growth had a really wonderful presentation from uh, archi an architect who's working on those exact sorts of things and ex with wonderful examples. So I'd say, was that two, three years ago, maybe? Really excellent. Two years ago. Two years ago. Yeah. Southgate Plaza is an example. They've okay. yeah. put housing in. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So another great discussion. It would be even better if Ken were here, but maybe there'll be a chance uh, another time. Um, so let's roll along to our last topic, which. That was, um, so that was. Oh yeah, yes. Yeah, so okay. One more. One more slide, and. This is also. Yeah. This is the land use as well, and the, these are uh, you want maybe to go back. This, or? Yeah, yeah, real quickly. These are are things we really have just been talking about in this discussion of key key elements. I mean, particularly the uh, in incentivizing for the development, but you see a role for uh, walking, biking, and public transit. We haven't mentioned livable communities, but that quality public spaces is actually a really important part of it, and. I think as we, we've referenced many times, Portsmouth has building blocks in place to pivot off of. We're not starting with a blank sheet, whether it's the bike ped plan or the blue ribbon committee's pol policy recommendations for transportation or the master plan. The elements are there, and hopefully the climate action plan can be another key source for pivoting when it comes to actually making investment and policy decisions. But let's go to the next topic, community engagement, which like um, land use is a broad but actually critical foundational element of what we're thinking about. Honey? It's like half of my slide. It's not showing the whole slide? If you click it's next, I think. Next slide. I think you've got an animation. Click, I've got try, an animation. No. <laughs> I didn't even know. There it is. <laughs> Nicely animated. I had to go past and back. Okay, the, miss, the Miss and Ken did these beautiful slides, uh, and fixed them, and probably animated yours. Uh, well, first I want to say that I think uh, Councillor Cook and Councillor Denton were two of the three councillors who rode the bus during the last municipal um, campaign, election campaign, and um, we need more people like you, I mean, we need you, <laughs> plus more like you, um, to show the way. Because um, I ride the bus, and I don't know too many people who ride the bus here. Um, so, yay. Yay, Wes. Um, so I'm going to read, because otherwise I get carried away and just don't focus. Um, so community engagement was my topic, and it is a powerful tool to incentivize these behavior changes. Any solution to the climate crisis in our country um, will include um, dramatically reducing the greenhouse <coughs> gas emissions, and the transportation sector is typically the largest um, emitter at 30 to 40 percent nationally and locally. So actions taken voluntarily at the individual and household level can significantly contribute to the overall emissions reductions. Um, and we can do that even if we don't have any policy changes. In Portsmouth, a lot of people are willing to make changes to address climate issues, but they may not know where to start. So shifting individual behaviors is an integral, scalable component of achieving necessary emissions reductions and um, almost a century of research shows that people are influenced by the behaviors of others, right? So 
Engaging some people in individual action can lead to many more people engaging in those actions. So community engagement would allow us to engage more people and also um, allow the CAP to focus on a more inclusive and equitable dialogue with all transportation users from all neighborhood. That's where it's like, ding. Um, and also to draw on all the existing um, organization. They may not all be local, they may be regional. I put some logos on the slide. Um, those are already in place and they already have um, access to groups in the community. Um, and we can also look at other communities of similar size and background. Second slide, please. So um, community engagement should be included in the implementation of our strategies here tonight, but also in the larger scope of this committee. And um, I chose to highlight Portland, Maine um, for my uh, strategy. Um, Portland, Maine has this program called CTL, Community Transportation Leaders whose focus is to bring more community involvement in shaping a more inclusive public transportation system. And so um, their goal is different than ours, obviously, because ours is greenhouse gas emissions reduction, but it could be um, adapted to, um, to get our community more involved in this transportation shift mode. Um, the participants for that program um, are passionate about transportation. Um, they have a lot of ideas, knowledge um, about this focus, and um, they are trained. They, they become CTL, um, community transportation leaders. They are trained during a six-week program, and then they go out in the community, and they share what they have learned, and they create their own groups of advocates. Um, and it also gives them a chance to have a seat at the table. So um, implementing a program like Portland would require internal organizational champions who are committed to um, cultivation of a necessary buy-in and also accountability. Um, and this approach would engender, it would engender a um, bottom-up process which might bring some resistance or strong reactions. But from what I've read and from what we've discussed, <coughs> I think if we keep focus on um, greenhouse gas um, emission reduction, and if we reach out to those organization in my first slide, you know, if we keep in mind those, then we can stay focused and um, get to results. Um, the Portland Main Program and others that we ident identified in our best practices document use social marketing and also um, universal design and other methods to engage individuals wherever they are in the community. And I think that's very important, regardless of class, race, gender, age, um, ability, um, et cetera. And we can um, tailor a message that will encourage everyone to share their behavior, to change their behavior um, to more sustainable transportation practices. So that's all. Thank you. Thank you. If there's a quick comment on that, otherwise we'll flip very quickly through our sort of summary slides and, and then I'll leave it to Herb and uh, Peter, if we've got a little bit of time to talk about next steps, because I know we've taken a big uh, bite out of your agenda. Yeah, if we could kind of move it along, because we do, we just have a couple old business items and a few a few things to, to go yeah. through after you're done. Yeah, so very, let's just uh, do the last slides really quickly. This is our part of our, our of our vision, which is really the sort of vertical stack, and you see in Portsmouth, uh, the, the really the focus of investments uh, is down at the bottom with the private vehicles and um, freight, which often we have very little as a city uh, influence <coughs> over. But uh, we're trying to stress where the opportunities are for reducing greenhouse gas 
emissions from the transportation sector, and that's giving more attention to those top public transport cyclists, pedestrians, but doing it in a way that connects all of those. So, uh, for example, improving first mile, last mile access to uh, really attractive public transit to make it uh, competitive with personal vehicles. Next slide. And this is a, a summary of our five topics, and I think we, we're trying very hard to connect those together. So I think you'll see that the one topic really uh, links through dotted lines to all the other topics. It's com complete, complete packages, which I think is really, really uh, essential. You see the community engagement being really under underpinning for that because we're talking about building community and political support for um, likely travel behavior changes to incentivize that and potentially uh, political and community, community public support for public and probably private sector investments in some of these strategies to actually get at the large, knocking down the large uh, greenhouse gas uh, source of transportation. And last slide is just once over quickly with our uh, priority strategies. And then the last slide is as much time or even a few minutes, and maybe this is something to carry over for another meeting, is your ideas on next steps for this. I mean, this group has been very hard working for three months. I think a lot of passion reflected in this. Uh, we have approached it as input, food for thought, going into the Climate Action Plan. I think Peter and this committee have stressed the importance of getting a run, sort of a running start on generating ideas, but I think we really see this as a, as a contribution to community engagement that will be an essential part of the Climate Action Plan. But we would love to get any... Uh, uh, feed, feedback on um, ways this group and these ideas can continue to contribute to the Climate Action Plan, first as it's developed and ultimately as those um, reduction strategies, transport and other sectors uh, will need to be implemented. So that's, that's our story. I, I just have a question there. Yeah. Um, this is great. Thank you guys for putting all this together. and, and uh, it is a critical part of the Climate Action Plan, but it also is a first step in terms of, it, well, it seems like you have a set of presentations or one presentation for outreach that you could go talk to the community about, and whether that's now or whether it's a, through the identified part of the Climate Action Plan, but we're gonna need volunteers to talk to the community, and so I guess maybe for me, a next step would be helpful to think about how you could bring it out to the public and where, you know, one of the things we're talking about is is where's an event where you could go and and you know sort of team up with someone who's doing something and take a few minutes to talk about transportation and get support because what we really need is support in the community to bolster the the ask of the city council for more funds so that the community is on board and and these are great points you make and really doable a lot of them are really doable in Portsmouth so um, I really like how you kind of how it kind of fits in with what you can do here in the city so um, and a lot of it. A lot of it's focused on municipal or federal or other funding sources, but a lot of it is also what people can do on their own. So that's the key, I think, is and private those, and private businesses. Private, yeah. Yep. yep. So I was going to piggyback on. I'm sorry, what what Peter said, and and maybe in December the group could come back with a couple of recommendations for, you know, here's two or three things that the the group feels we could start taking on action right now. So for example, if there's lots of federal funds that are available, right? It, you know, what would it take to start the process in moving forward on some of those? Because you know, if that's gonna take three months, six months, you know, then we're not using city dollars, right? We're not using tax dollars. You know, we're, we're talking about you know, getting uh, federal dollars and, and using those. But I, mean, I think that's, I don't know what others think about that. My recommendation is, you know, next next meeting to come back and with a couple of these. And, and as Peter said, they're going to have to have have the ability to be able to go, you know, volunteers to be able to go out into the community and to push these not only with the city but with the community too. With the community, yeah. Buy in, yeah. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Um, 
think one of the things I'd be really interested is we talked about like there we have a lot of these plans um, and though some might need updates I think and what Councillor Cook was saying was you have the plan but the follow-through and also going back and being like hey we made this plan we're not doing these parts or we're not we're not on track for where we intended when we made this plan and knowing where those points are because there are already things that have been approved and have had support in their approval and been passed and it's something that you can already stand on in a way and so instead of asking for you know what people might view as new funds it's this was already you know in promise to the community and through this plan um, and it sounds like there are some opportunities for things that are already in some of these plans to stand on a bit and be like we're upholding things that we've already seen because it is disappointing I think when you know and it it's hard on you start understanding the sentiment of like oh like another plan <laughs> you know and the follow-through is such an important part and also not just the follow-through but also sharing like sharing with the community the follow-through right so that they see it, it and happen. connect the dots as well I need Kate and Josh to be riding that bus every day <laughs> <laughs> well maybe uh, Savannah Boston and we'll all ride it yeah. Uh, yeah I was gonna say I, I think it's interesting that I would love it if we could be writing grants for these federal funds but I think probably the limiting factor the, the biggest limiting factor is staff hours mm -hmm. to do the research to write the grant um, I, and, well, and to on the ground put things in I mean there's there's a backlog of transportation projects to do now I think so yeah you know it's 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 money yeah. <laughs> it's not just money I mean we everybody in this room for sort of middle street I mean it's there's, yeah. there's uh, it more than just money it's oh. there's there's community buy-in that mm -hmm. needs to ha happen yeah that's right now I think one of the things though, that the group um, could do is I love this idea of community transportation leaders and I don't I don't think it's something that the city would have to be to start I think it's something that a, a group of caring individuals could start a group I, I when you were talking about this I was thinking about you know like leadership seacoast right you know the people who who do those those programs then they go out as ambassadors into the community for the program and then more people want to be selected and want to be chosen there's no reason why the community can't start a community transportation leaders program like in Portland even if it's not a city run event the city could ultimately take it over if that was the desire but but at least get it started so that you have kind of a selected class of people to go through a program and then all it would require is a meeting space and people doing proper people giving volunteer hours to set something like that up you think about nonprofits and the way they, they do it I, uh -huh. I just I, I look at that and I think we could start there you know that's something that, that might be a good place to start. one of the things that we've wrestled with is is our mission as a group to improve transportation in Portsmouth mm -hmm. period or is it to make transportation recommendations for the cap and those are not those aren't the same thing but they're closely related and any improvement to transportation that makes alternatives more attractive is going to reduce greenhouse gas emissions but i think the the way many of us have looked at this is the cap provides an opportunity to do some of these things that really need to be done so one of the things that i think is helpful for us and maybe that we can help contribute to is the importance of the cap and how that can end up leading to some of these things that are just missing missing in Portsmouth so I think every one of these is a great discussion and we, we could focus on one or more of them on the on the next meeting but I think maybe this anticipates a later topic that you have on the agenda for the uh, update on the status of the cap because once some of these strategies hold up and they end up in the table like Matt presented for um, let's see Charleston mm -hmm. you know it's in the cap bike ped shared mobility 15 minute city here's how much investment is here is uh, you know a million metric tons of carbon reduction uh, then that adds an impetus that's miss has been missing 
They, that's not going to determine creating a completely different transportation uh, effort, but it does provide an opportunity to add some, some impetus. So for the sake of time, one more comment from Effie, and then we're going to move on. <laughs> Yeah, and um, just briefly, uh, a lot of you know that we've been looking for a long time at uh, community interactive platforms mm -hmm. where people would want to do something about climate change in our community, but not know what to do. And they'd go on this site and there'd be things, and a lot of them would be related to transportation. So it's one aspect of community engagement. And that's... Um, partly what Annie talked about, where one individual picks up a behavior change and the neighbor sees, asks about it, and maybe a Girl Scout group or a church group takes on a particular topic where they like transportation, mm -hmm. and they all address it in their own way. Or so that's coming a school soon. group. Yeah, mm -hmm. school group. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> but we really want to do it in all these neighborhoods, because I work now by the mall on Gosling Road, and um, I ride there, I walk there, and I see people that walk, who walk and ride the bus or whatever, and I want them, I want them at this table mm -hmm. to say, mm -hmm. it's hard or it's easy or I want more of this. Yeah. I don't want just me who lives in my, I live in my comfortable place, I can walk to Hannaford's and get my hair done and everything. I want the others right. who are mm -hmm. not um, usually at the table. Mm -hmm. And I'm willing to do the work, but I don't want to be the only one doing the work. Mm -hmm. no. Sorry. Okay, so let's let's uh, close this topic out. But Bill, are you willing to come back with the group in December? I, I will check in with the group. Check My suspicion the... is probably yes. Okay. So count, count on that to be confirmed. Okay. All right. So let's move on. Uh, we're going to move on to the old business. The next item up is climate action plan update. Peter. So um, <clears throat> we got five proposals in. I don't think I said that. Yeah. That's very exciting. Better than zero. Um, we're moving, <laughs> moving fast. On a, better than zero, yeah. <laughs> five times better than zero. Um, some of them look really good. Um, they all look really good, frankly, but um, you know, obviously this kind of thing, some rise above the other, some for, from different places. I feel like I can't really talk too much about it the, in terms of who the firms are, but I can say that we got good, good results um, and we already um, met as a ta staff team to go over the five proposals and have some, <coughs> not a final decision, but some, a decision point to move on from. I don't know if I can say more than that, but um, it's very exciting, and we're looking forward to some really good outcomes and, and you know, asking for some information back from some firms and things like that. So um, I think by the next meeting, we should have a, a top candidate. Can I ask if there's a kind of a rough time frame for award that the city has in mind uh, now that the proposals are in? I would say probably by the end of November, we'll have a, probably a, a top choice. Hopefully, but it could be okay. the middle of December. But between, okay. you know, before Christmas, let's say that. That's fantastic. Yeah. That's good news. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, nice to uh, Just a point I brought up the last meeting. I'll bring it up again. Uh, you know, like we had the subcommittee to put together the proposal. I, I was thinking it would be useful uh, to have a sort of maybe call it an advisory group to work with whoever gets the contract to keep them on the track and keep them going and keep the dialogue happening and make things happen in the way that we yep. want them to happen at the speed we want them to happen. Yeah. Just bringing that up again. Well, certainly there's going to be, uh, and and actually in the all the proposals they mentioned working with city volunteers, mm -hmm. um, but I think um, we haven't really fleshed out how that's all going to yep. look, but okay. yeah, I think that makes sense. Okay. So, just oh. a quick question. Um, so you're going to be focused on a candidate, um, November, early December. Then what happens? I think we'll have a we'll have a you'll have a contract. a contract. Cool. Hopefully, yeah. before <coughs> Christmas, I think we'll have a contract. Right. Are you saying well. by the December yeah. meeting or maybe the January meeting? Or like I just, by the December meeting. You think so? I that think fast? So. Okay. I hope so. I hope I don't regret saying that. But <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 
And then what's the timeline for them to actually do the work and uh, we're the cap? hoping to have we'd like to have it done by this time next year, the whole cap. Wow. There'll that be a lot of work be. in between now and then. But right. that's optimistic. Would that be having it completed as in approved by the city council this time? Ready next to year? go to the city council before okay. December, hopefully. Mm. Yeah. Oh, yeah, definitely <laughs> before December. That's the goal. That's the goal this this year. Um, <laughs> and there's gonna be a lot of work in terms of uh, volunteer support. I know there's a lot going on already, but figuring out how to dovetail that's going to be important, and so we'll be talking more about that. Um, but really, I think we're asking asking them to be ready to work with city volunteers. We're asking them to bring information to the public about what climate action looks like, and then get information back from the public about what they want, what they want to see, and what they want to do, and what they support. Um, and so that's you know that's sort of the give and take and then the climate action plan hopefully isn't like some big long thing we don't want it to be we want it to be at real actions that we're taking forward so um, it's going to be the next steps and and i think there will be a lot of tie in to different port reports that are out there and things that because that will be information they can use to bring to the public you know the bike pet plan said you wanted i won't bring this up bike lanes on middle street or something along those lines, you know. Um, what do you think about that? These these are things in this plan that weren't implemented. What about some of these? Or or if that's transportation, but then there's a whole other, you know, the master plan had a whole bunch of recommendations that could be looked at. You know, there's a lot to bring forward. So, do we have any influence on setting the timeline? Can we can we give them a, a deadline for it? Yep. Uh, all I'm thinking is that uh, December is right after the next election, and who knows what the city council makeup will be at that point. Hopefully, similar January. to current, council if not. Won't be till January. Mm -hmm. True. Well, I thought we talked. To, didn't we talk about um, finishing up the cap before the elections? If we can, we will. That might be a little yeah. too aggressive, yeah. but that was before the second round. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. If we if we didn't if we had gotten five proposals initially, it'd be easier, but. Yeah. It's possible. We'll see how they how they shape up. But mm -hmm. um. it's really fun to hear this after <laughs> sitting <laughs> sitting in this room for, for <clears throat> a little while. Yep. Yeah. Hearing about it and now it's yeah, it's yeah. moving along. Yeah. Yep. Pretty exciting. Okay. Eight. Any more to add? I mean, they all of them looked pretty. They were all different, and they were all had really cool, innovative ideas. And the community engagement sections of a lot of these had really um, interesting different proposals. Like a lot of them brought up city hall or town hall style meetings and different neighborhood sort of level engagement. For the most part, I think all of them really touched on equity issues and trying to address underrepresented groups around the city, which is going to be really important for this, I think, especially with the engagement. And a lot of the timelines look pretty good for community engagement, I think, for that phase one part is pretty much all spring into early summer next year, so it's gonna be long and thorough, I think. So I, I think we're in good shape, hopefully. Hopefully. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right on. Okay, so. any other questions, comments on, on the cap? Okay, moving on. I can add to that, Yep. Um, because Effie had brought it up, the, the Clean Energy New Hampshire. Okay. The city's gonna join, as recommended by this committee. The city manager was on board, and. <laughs> We're gold members. Gold? Yeah. We're not members yet, but we have authorization to go what ahead was and do the, that. It was, there was two gold, and was there standard no? or something? Standard. Like, yeah. Oh, so we're top tier. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. So we get like uh, <laughs> you, get, you get more uh, more free uh, t-shirts. <laughs> free um, passes to an events. Exactly yeah. passes to an event. Yep. Yeah. <clears throat> to the Clean Energy New Hampshire event. Okay. So that could be, could those be used, I know the city's paying for that membership, could those seats be used by not only city employees, but also, say, members of this committee? And that's what I gotta figure out, how we okay. how we give those out, but. Um, okay. If, yeah, I would I would hope we could at least goals. get a couple for the committee. Lottery. <laughs> lottery, yeah. <laughs> Just ask. Lottery. Lottery. This is like extra baseball tickets, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, it's not like Taylor Swift tickets. <laughs> oh, gosh. Right. So that's good, yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay. Positive I'm result. Fan, but yeah. I hear it's bad. Right? <laughs> that's all I heard about all week. <laughs> yeah. Okay, anything else on the clean energy? 
Is, did John? Did you say uh, Effie that John also had some comments about that, or no? John had brought it forward. He, he brought it forward. It he's a member. Email and put it on the agenda. Yeah. yeah. Oh, he's a, an individual member. Yep. Yeah. Right. Good for him. Yep. Yeah. Right on. Okay. Um, next uh, old business item is the Green Building Subcommittee update. Yeah. Is that you, Tori? It is. Um, so last meeting we talked about at which direction we go at this. Originally we were pushing towards looking, and this is talking of municipality policy, so policy by the city for city projects specifically. Um, originally we were talking about having that be a policy that was a city council policy, um, and we kind of shifted towards looking at instead of that method maybe going more through city manager because it is such a internal process and that maybe it makes more sense to do that and leave the kind of city council side for when we're doing more community based initiatives um, so reframing that definitely some conversations to do with Peter on what maybe how to re how that looks different um, depending on what direction uh, been getting I've had a couple of meetings with people who seem interested to come and um, give perspective who are in the industry, which has been really great. I think that's a big part as we're coming up with these. Um, the city one is a little bit easier because the scope and scale is rather controlled, but especially as we get into the community and you're getting into private and you're getting into development and the more perspective, the better, because um, it gets a little bit more complicated. So. Um, have a couple people, at least one, um, likely a couple more who might be interested in helping Aubrey and I um, and talking with Peter on that side of things to just get more perspectives throughout the industry. Um, kind of that built environment industry is important. Um, so that's moving along and uh, hopefully we will, I can finish up kind of re- framing that policy and getting it um, back to DPW and then in the city manager's hand to hopefully push that down the road. And then Kate um, connected uh, me and we have a meeting with our inspector um, because he is interested in talking, starting to talk about, you know, green building code within the city. Um, he just did a pretty comprehensive review of the city building code. Um, something he's interested in talking about and possibly incentives and where building inspections and permitting can come into that equation. So that meeting will be next week and I'm very excited about that. I think that's an awesome opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, first conversation will just be figuring out where, where we see that. I think as Kate mentioned before, uh, time and hours on the city staff side is always a really hard thing and so figuring out how we can do this where it's not like the solution's not hire another person to you know do more work because that might not always be reasonable um so good conversations to be had all around so definitely progress and i think that there's a lot of conversations i know uh, the city policy i definitely would like love to put in front of the transportation group because there are a lot of overlap on some of that stuff um i think it all will be it <laughs> yes that but <laughs> i want to make sure that you guys have input as well and if there's other ways that maybe it could be phrased or moved at differently and better i think it's really important to have that input so yeah, that's where we're at and um did i see in a newsletter city newsletter or someplace where the um the building department were, were they going to do a seminar maybe i saw that for builders about green building or something like that hmm. And, and maybe on the code, right? Probably on code, the code updates mm. for, for the updates, energy, probably. Yeah. Energy yeah. code. Yeah. 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 So the co the uh, building codes are updating. They're kind of like in the they're a middle child right now. Um, you can still use old codes, but in not very long, mm -hmm. you will have to use the new code. So they they give a buffer time period essentially. Um, and we are about to switch over not to the newest code, but to. <laughs> <laughs> second newest code because we were on real old code <laughs> and now we're on kind of old code um, but it's also state that's a state thing um, I don't know actually I don't know in New Hampshire what the law is about 
city is taking. I don't think we can take on a newer code you than can't. the state has accepted. No. I, I don't think so. Yeah. Not without some. Yeah. yeah there's, not without there's some, some. Yeah. There's some ways to do it. Some uh, uh, <laughs> talking about yeah. finagling. Not um, easy. So that's probably what that is because when you have new code, there's new requirements and numbers that people have known for the last three, four years are suddenly changing, and so um, and energy codes get are getting more and more a part of that building code conversation. And often that has to do with insulation amounts and certain practices on that side. Um, but I think you had mentioned in a previous meeting that a lot of builders will actually exceed what the codes are because, right, I mean, that just makes sense, right, to build buildings that are, the, the codes are, don't go far, and these are the national codes, I thought you had said, really even now don't go far enough well not even close yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. so. the thing that I would say there is that the code set the floor mm -hmm. and it's like the codes the worst building that you can legally build exactly <laughs> <laughs> yeah codes are codes are a safety measure and a floor mostly um, yeah. And so on the energy side, you know, you don't have the same safety conversation that you have maybe on the structural and fire side where it's rather obvious why we need <laughs> certain I, things. There's a, there's a double side to that. The, the, the codes were written looking from a historic perspective. And as new advances in building performance uh, and energy management come to the floor, uh, they can often bump up against standards that already exist. Uh, so it's a, it's a, it's a interesting area. I'm, I'm wondering if you've had any contact with the New Hampshire chapter of the U.S. Green Building Council. Yes. Good. I, yes. <laughs> um, yeah, and LEED and Passive House and some of the standards are part of what we're um, proposing in a lot of our policies, they're a great way to go about that in a way that's a lot of um, a lot of builders and projects are going that direction. And it's not because code told them to. It's um, especially any building that's built. So like federal has uh, very high standards for these things because they also are interested in you know they're maintaining and paying for the energy in these buildings. So there is you know the 40 year life payback on these is obvious it, it tells you which way makes sense and that's being efficient um, it gets harder when you talk start talking about development or building things for quick sale mm -hmm. <laughs> because if you're building something to just sell it you don't care how much the energy bill is and that's where having that floor and having energy codes is important um, because then you have that baseline but the energy code is not is not uh, very inspiring, let's put it that way. Yeah. Uh, but practice tends to be above, and I think a big part of the builders, especially on the smaller side, um, that's an important part of the conversation, is programs like New Hampshire Saves, programs um, that incentivize mm -hmm. remodeling and stuff. Like Builders like that. It is a, it's a structured way for their business. It brings in um, revenue and business that's clear and un and can often have incentives for them as well. Um, and so it tends to be received pretty positively um, on that side, as long as it's not super, super restrictive. Um, because at the end of the day, too, you have to make sure that it's, um, it's not upgrade to something that's incredibly expensive and difficult or don't upgrade, mm, right? Yeah. And then you have to be able to have so, yeah. Reasonable things in between. Is the right. so I, I understand that the the quick turnover develop developer project doesn't have an incentive to build. Is it the same thing with rental properties? So if they're not going to be paying for the utilities, yeah, is there any way to incentivize that building? Um, yes. Yeah. <clears throat> it's, it's harder <laughs> to do it in a positive manner. I would say it's harder to incentivize um, because. You, so there are like um, Hanover and a couple other cities have approached when they when they approach their energy they also approach the demand side and try to reduce it and they do things like window inserts and <coughs> these types of programs and they work and they're good and a renter can do those and put those in rentals if they're paying for utilities right and maybe their landlord doesn't particularly care but they do 
Um, they aren't as flashy as, <laughs> as solar panels or other things, so they don't... Uh, you don't hear about it? I think it. the phrase is often, like, uh, energy efficiency isn't sexy. Like, no one, like the, the other side, the supply side, tends to get more attention. Um, so there are a lot of options on that side. Um, it's a little bit trickier, but they're there. Yeah, and I'm, oh, sorry. No, I was going to say, the real challenge around that is, is the affordability. Mm -hmm. That's what you're fighting. Mm -hmm. constantly yeah. if you have dual if you've competing interests you want green buildings but you also want affordability you know where's the good balance yeah mm -hmm. how do you make them affordable and green yes well it, and I, I mentioned earlier I was just at a, a symposium yesterday on on all this for Massachusetts and there are a few takeaways from it um, one was they're making massive improvements on their their state building code and especially the stretch code which I was actually surprised to find out that um, the current stretch code, 300 communities in Massachusetts have adopted and only 52 haven't. So most of the state has adopted those. Um, and they're about to be updating that. But then one of the big feedbacks from actual practitioners in the field is like, yeah, but where's the enforcement? You know, um, the hmm. inspectors all over the place just aren't checking for that. You know, they're checking that the structure's right, that the plumbing is good, that the electric isn't going to electrocute anybody or burn the building down, but they just didn't have the bandwidth to then look at the details of the air sealing barrier and the, the insulation and, and all that stuff so that there really needs to be investment put into that side of it as well. Um, and I, I, I just saw an article today that was actually really depressing, but also... Um, <laughs> brings to fore how important this is in that one of the um, things that was put out at the current COP conference is that the built sector in the world has lost ground. Um, just from 2020, we're 2% higher in emissions worldwide than we were then. From the built environment. Uh, or actually, I'm sorry, that was 4% higher for just the built environment over 2020 mm -hmm. and 2% higher than the peak which was in 2019 before the pandemic. Mm. So we're actually losing ground. So this is an area that we really need to be putting a ton of energy into. And, and worldwide, it's like 35-ish percent of greenhouse gas emissions in the built environment. So it's right behind transportation is the, mm -hmm. the next biggest thing to do. And that's often not including the manufacturing of the materials for the built environment. So I wonder if that is partly because the world is developing more and so that, that's exactly it um, is that um, improvements are being made but the square footage of the built environment is moving faster than the improvements for efficiency well in life cycle right you're when, when you build a building that's a hundred year commitment right and you're going to be dealing with that for a long time um, and you know a card of 500,000 miles is still Right. Teen years, you know, so you're just talking about decisions that are made 50 years ago are still very relevant right. in that conversation and those numbers. Um, so it's unfortunate because it makes it hard because you're making progress, but you're really fighting a lot of buildings and then, you know, bringing the historical context and, um, you know, but new buildings is not the only way. <laughs> but, no, retrofits are yeah. key. And I think there's a huge opportunity with um, I mean, the energy costs that are happening and that people are feeling that and they're 100% um, rightfully very concerned about that. And that's a security thing. That's an equity issue in our communities um, and thing programs that focus on improving, affordably approving, improving buildings, um, whether you own them or not is something that will hit home with a lot of people. Um, so I think it's something that we really should consider because, um, and we've, we've talked about a little bit, like how do we do those next steps and how do we tie these into um, maybe certain things, funding, community projects. Um, and so that's all part of the conversation, definitely. It's, uh, it's a big one. <laughs> <laughs> we might see some interesting developments in the energy efficiency sector out of the UK because everybody's feeling the pinch as far as energy prices go yeah. it's them so maybe I, I have no idea but it'd be fun to research and see what if anything has developed in, in that space and yeah. see if we could apply it here 
I'm going to be honest, and I, do, uh, I don't think that we have a technology issue in green building. I think oh, we have no, an I, implementation I totally agree issue. We, we, have the, yeah. we have the methods. We have the technology. Yes, it can be better, and yes, there are innovative ways to make it better, but you can, you can get there with what oh, yeah. we have now. Yeah, the, the technology <laughs> is there. What, what isn't there is the full buy-in and uptake mm -hmm. and you know, the, the architects that know to build to design to that and the engineers that know how to design to that and the <laughs> builders and tradespeople that know how to assemble them and the people that see the value and want to want to build that way it's it's a paradigm shift and but you're absolutely right Ben that all the the best technology for it is coming out of Europe because they've been dealing with higher energy prices for a long time. Well, and there's, they're, they've now got their, their hands is, is being forced, so you know, we're seeing probably more buy-in just out of necessity. Um, so hopefully we don't get to that point here, but you know, it would be interesting to see if, if some of that momentum, if we could find a way to translate that, because like you said, we have the technology. So uh, next steps, summary. Where do you go? meeting with building inspector? Get the municipal policy in the city manager's hands and yeah. with DPW a little bit more, um, and hopefully get that rolling down the road. And then the next like big step is figuring out of, on the community side, on the you know uh, outside of the city, yeah. green building uh, codes or initiatives or programs for community. Um, and what those look like and how those balance. And um, I mean, funding is always <laughs> part of that conversation, as we know. So, so if you want to have a conversation about that, I'd be happy to. I formed the Green Building Council. In New Hampshire? Uh-huh. I didn't know that. Well, there you and, go. And the, econo the economics are actually on the side of green buildings. Oh, but yeah. And it's convincing and the myth, people that. The myth is that they're expensive. I just wanted to put in a plug for uh, some of the uh, work that we've started doing on the sub the sub council for uh, community engagement, uh, which is Jess, Effie, and I. And I know Jess just had a conversation with the library. Is it community coordinator? Well, I can't remember what her mm -hmm. title is. Something like that. Uh, she's very interested. And the library is very interested in uh, a hosting. Um, community engagement talks, programs, workshops, whatever it may be, uh, they really want to get more involved in that. And um, recently we had, what was it, Button Up? Yeah. I missed it. It was but great. Was it yeah, great? It was good. And I missed that. But, you know, that Button Up uh, presentation uh, or event, you know, it's a perfect example. <coughs> yeah. Types of it's things a great that, space for public yeah. meetings, too. Yeah. yeah. And I, I just put in a plug to the eco kids at the high school about this committee. But then somebody said, well, we used to be doing a lot of drawdown stuff. And, and I don't know much about the drawdown group, but those things that were, you know, going at the library, community things, those are things that the, the students are, are really into and, and would like to contribute. So if there's any yeah. new, new initiatives, you know, we want to. Would wanna you say, Ben, that students would rather do things in person or online? Or is it a mix like everybody? <laughs> It's, it's complicated. We're having this problem <coughs> with SECO uh, students for sustainability. Some people want to do digital and some people don't. And I'm in the camp of like, I got so burnt out on Zoom that I, I want the, the personal interaction. <laughs> and then some people are like, oh, I don't want to go, don't go drive anywhere. And so then you get people who don't show up to either one. It's like you, you get the worst of both worlds. Does it have to be one or the other? So I think the, the hybrid, that's an excellent segue. I think the hybrid model might be the, the best, at least for now. But uh, people yeah, certainly yeah. would come to an in-person event. Yeah, we just have to work on our hybrid techniques. <laughs> this is the best I've seen so far. Mm -hmm. I think so. there's definitely some space for uh, student involvement with that municipal policy, too, that hopefully will be going through, um, even if it's just when, hopefully, the city manager brings it to the council yep. for official approval. You know, that's, that's schools. That's, you know, and I know that's a big thing for a lot of students is they're learning and they care about these things and they're sitting in a school that yeah. doesn't always exemplify <laughs> those values. Um, and so, 
I hopefully maybe we can coordinate that too because I think it's mm-hmm. always great to see young involvement saying yes yeah. this is then you what ra- we want. you rounded up uh, two or three classmates that said they were really interested in the transportation group but too busy at the moment. As, as you, as, I was going to say, as, as Bill has seen, we we are interested. We are also unreliable at times, but uh, <laughs> we can we can certainly be conduits to other students. Like that's kind of how I see myself. It's like, well, if I can't do it, I'll find somebody else who might be able to. So there's a good network in place, and and that was a that was a strange. Uh, phenomenon that of three people nobody <laughs> could make, and it's not always. They're like all that. really interested. <laughs> but but um, I think people will be a little more available going into the winter with the the, the college stuff behind us more and yeah. more, um, and you know younger students too. We just have to we have to convince them that it's not scary. <laughs> we have to yeah. say it's okay. They're nice. Um, so that's <laughs> a, an ongoing struggle. But there are certainly ways. I mean, and Effie, we we've we've communicated for for quite a while and. Um, Again, sometimes students are hard to, to, to engage, but eventually it can be done. Yeah. There are ways of doing it. So yeah, I'm always, my, my inbox is always open to anybody. Okay. All right, so I don't want to cut you off, but you're good? I'm good. All right. Let's move on to uh, new business. Wes, you wanted to take a few minutes. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. The Reinvestment in shoreline economies and ecosystems bill uh, would bring uh, direct support to seacoast communities uh, using funds from um, largely offshore wind and and other uh, energy uh, programs that have to pay taxes to the federal government. Um, There is a chance that it will pass it can pass in this Congress before the end of the year. Um, I know this because people that don't ca- reach out to me casually sent me a note the other day saying that that's the way it is. Um, Jean Shaheen is a co-sponsor of this bill in the Senate. Mm-hmm. The bill also exists in the House. Uh, Chris Pappas is not a co-sponsor, nor is Maggie Hassan yet. Okay. Um, Quite simply, I'm here to ask uh, this committee, you individually, uh, to communicate with Chris and Maggie. Well, c- communicate with all three of them. One, to Jean to say thank you for your leadership. Second, to uh, Maggie and, and Chris to uh, please step up and co-sponsor this. The more, the, very simply, the more co-sponsors a bill has, the better the chances of it uh, passing. This happens to be a bill that's a smart bill from the standpoint of um, adapting to and preparing for uh, greater impacts of climate change. It's a bill that's bipartisan. Um, it's a, so it's an easy it's an easy sell. And the council has a history of going out on a rim limb and endorsing something as weird as carbon fee and dividend years ago. <laughs> what was the title of the bill again? Rise. Rise. Um, it's, it, reinvestment. It's reinvestment in shoreline economies and ecosystems. And what all does it if you, under cover? If you look it up, um, you can use the acronym RISEE, R-I-S-E-E. If you find it, can you tell us what the bill number is? Yeah, see if I could find it. I'm so used to looking White at House this House you, you could just use that acronym and, and get to the bill number. And there's a separate bill in the Senate and the House. Okay. Do you know if the, in the Senate, if the, if they called the Gang of Ten, but the, the bipartisan group is, is supporting this? Well, it's, it's sitting in committee. Um, if it if it's gonna if it's gonna get passed, it'll yes, get okay. slipped yeah, into okay. an omnibus bill at the end of the year. Okay. Um, the okay. author of the bill is Senator Whitehouse from Rhode Island, okay. who's probably the most enlightened and uh, progressive person on climate. Great. And the the uh, for Portsmouth, it's actually really good too because it takes revenues from offshore wind to local communities along the coast. So it could even. Be even a bigger benefit for coastal communities. So, being the bashful guy that I am, I sent a note to the entire city council the other day, <laughs> asking that you um, establish a resolution. 
No, um, and now I'm in the question of how do I follow up? No, I sit on the legislative subcommittee. I'll reach out to the mayor it's, because it's he chairs already, that. I talked to Jane and she's going to put it on the agenda. Good. Okay. Yeah. See. Thank you. That's exciting. <laughs> yes. I don't even have to do it. Yeah. It's already done. <laughs> right. Yeah. Good. So that's a that's a testimony to people's awareness and readiness to act. Yeah. I think that's an example of how we don't have to wait for the cap. I mean, resiliency right. is something. We don't have something. to. And we haven't. We've been doing things. Yeah. <laughs> right. yeah. But, like, you know, that's, we all know what the cap's going to say, and that's that yeah. we live on the ocean, and that's. Well, and the same with green buildings. You know, the municipal green building policy, we've we've only built lead lead certified buildings, and I think that will continue. But it's important to show you know a commitment to it, if we're especially if we're going to tell people in the community to do it. So. Well, and there's also, I think the really important element here is the idea that it's going to fund um, local communities that, with direct impacts, because in the state of New Hampshire, if if the federal government gets out ahead of this and says we're going to fund local communities with shoreline impacts, then the state can't come back and say we're going to allow wind farms, but all the funding <laughs> and taxation goes fund? to the state, not right. to the local right. communities yeah. that are mostly impacted. So I think it would be important to have federal legislation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I look at it, we kind of have this disproportional situation with the hotels here mm -hmm. in the mm -hmm. city, and we can't do a, pi a pillow tax because of state legislation. And then, you know, but the tax dollars collected here tend to not end up here in Portsmouth from all those hotels and restaurants. But that's another, that's for another <laughs> meeting, another day. <laughs> another <laughs> topic. All right, so is uh, there, oh, sorry. So does everybody know how to reach um, our members of Congress? I found a contact yeah. page yeah. in very small print. Yeah. On the <laughs> website, congress.gov. And you probably you want to call their main office, not the offshoot offices. Um, yes, yeah. call DC. All right. Sounds Hell great. Oh. Thank we're, you. We're going to finish on time. Thank tonight. you for including. Beautiful. Uh, Absolutely. So, yeah. want to close the meeting out? Do we want to stop the recording and then we'll just do a quick check, um, um, take away? Uh, we're yeah. trying to do this thing where we say the next meeting is December 15th. Oh, oh yeah. And who's doing go, the notes? And yeah, that would be important. <laughs> <laughs> and it is, you know, it's an early one it because is. of Christmas. Right, uh, just like this so one. December 15th. Yeah. Okay. And I don't know I, who is, uh, let's see, I was supposed to be note taker. And so I'm more than happy <laughs> oh, no, to be the Tory. note taker for right. December 15th. Well, usually the note taker is the presenter at the next meeting, so that would be Tori. John Kennedy isn't here, so he could either be the note taker or you could be the note. He was a note taker, though, wasn't he? He yeah, was. I babied out he of, was uh, the note. Uh, yeah, the you're out of sync. Us. But either John or Tori will present, <laughs> and you can be the note taker like, if you're yeah, so willing. Yeah, so I'll be note taker, and Tori, are you going to be here on the 15th, and you will yes. be facilitator? Thanks. Oh, that was so oh, easy. Check that before. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think John can. I think he will. will okay, so if, you, we'll if you'd summer. rather I, have him, it's up to you, really. It does matter. I, mean, I can do it summer, I think. We'll, we'll just coordinate with John and Corey, uh, John and, and Tori before the next meeting and figure out who the, uh -oh. yes. who okay. the facilitator yes. is. But you can be the note taker. I, I'll be the note taker. I haven't done it for yet, that. so it'll oh, be a good, good experience yep. for me. Yeah, you'll learn a, a lot. change of fitness <laughs> for <laughs> Okay, so um, I know Bert always firm. likes yeah. to do a takeaway. We just run around the room real quick. Sure. Stop the recording and recording stopped. Okay.